Well, hello everyone. We are here today for a closer look at Hawaii sea turtles hosted by Maui Nui Marine Resource Council, a nonprofit working for healthy coral reefs and clean ocean water for the islands of Maui County. This program is made possible with the support from the County of Maui Mayor's Office of Economic Development. I'm Darla Palmer Ellingson, tonight's MC and host of the public affairs program Island Environment 360, which uh, airs on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. on H Hawaii media radio stations. This event is being shown on Zoom and Facebook Live. It will also be recorded for YouTube, provided to Akaku Community Media, and aired on H Hawaii media radio, radio stations statewide. We do ask that everyone keep their settings on mute and if you wish to ask a question, please do use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, sometimes you have to scroll over to see the menu if you're on, on Zoom there. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, you can ask your questions via the comments and uh, we'll have someone relaying your questions back over to me and I can ask the speaker for you. Our speakers will be answering questions at the end of their presentation. We also have a special treat for you, two quick videos which we will show at the end with updates about Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's work to improve ocean water quality in Ma'alaya Bay using oysters and by reducing sediment runoff in the Pohokea watershed. Now to introduce our special guest speakers. Dr. Cameron Allen is a wildlife endocrinologist with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association Administration, sorry, commonly referred to as NOAA. She is the supervisory marine biological researcher at the Joint Institute for Marine and Atmospheric Research at NOAA Fisheries Pacific Island Fisheries Science Center in the Protected Species Division. Shondell Brunson is NOAA's Sea Turtle Stranding Coordinator for Hawaii and the Pacific Islands region. Welcome Cameron and Shondell. So Shondell, if you're with us, I am just gonna turn it over to you to start your part of the presentation. Are you ready? I am. Can you hear me okay? We can. Great. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share screen. And let me know when we're ready to go. Go ahead and take it away. All right. Well, first of all, I would like to thank the Maui Nui Marine Resource Council for having both um, Cameron and I to speak today about um, our sea turtles here in Hawaii. I know they are near and dear to all of our hearts, so hopefully we will share some insights um, to our local turtles here around the islands. I will be speaking directly about sea turtle strandings in Hawaii and what we are learning about threats for, from the strandings, rehabilitations, and the deaths. In a second. There it is. <laughs> um, so we define a stranding as an event in which a sea turtle is found dead, injured, sick, tumored, or in an otherwise abnormal condition, usually along the shoreline. So what is the purpose of maintaining a stranding network? Um, it is pretty much based off of the Endangered Species Act, um, Section 10, to enhance the propagation or survival of the affected species, uh, which um, here in Hawaii is uh, the sea turtle. So in the Pacific Islands, we have five species um, of sea turtles. We have the leatherback, the loggerhead, olive ridley, the green, and the hawksbill. The leatherback, the loggerhead, and olive ridley are pelagic or um, offshore species that we don't see too often. We may see them uh, sometimes as bycatch uh, in the fisheries but typically we don't see them here near shore. The two most common turtles that we see near shore are the green and the hawksbill. So 
So just kind of give you a little bit of difference between the two. I think most are familiar with the green sea turtle or the Chelonia Midas, known as Honu. Um, and then we have the hawksbill, which has more of a hawk-like beak. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference in the water. Uh, they may have more serrated edges, but it can be a little difficult, but looking at their beak and their front scales can kind of give um, an idea of the hawksbill turtle. And they have differences in their feeding um, in their diet. So green turtles are herbivores that eat mainly algae and the hawksbill turtles eat more sponges and invertebrates. So um, in coordination uh, throughout the island chain, we have developed a stranding network uh, with many collaborators and partners. And here in your Maui Nui complex from Molokai, Lanai, and Maui, uh, we mainly partner with the Marine or Maui Ocean Center, Marine Institute, Palama Lanai, and the University of Hawaii Maui College, the Marine Option Program. We have several students that are able to work with the Marine Option Program and help us in our stranding network. Um, in addition to that, we definitely rely heavily on the state of Hawaii, DLNR, DAR, and DOE care, um, particularly during these times of COVID. So talking about sea turtle threats in order of prevalence or um, most common here in Hawaii uh, is the hook and fishing gear-induced trauma hook and line that we see most commonly and has been up and coming as a top threat. Previously our top threat was fibropapillomatosis or the tumor disease. Many may have seen them on the near shore um, come up as you can see here their abnormal growths um, that block their vision and their feeding. And we also have net and gill net fishing gear induced trauma. Boat strikes shark attacks, and miscellaneous. This was actually a case that I helped on with the turtle washing up and get stuck in the, in the crevice. Um, and I believe recently off of Kihei, there's a couple locations that they're coming up and getting stuck in the rocks where they're, they're feeding off of and we're getting calls of having to go get them out of the rocks and, and release them. So this is a graph just showing um, our top threats. And over the years, we've had uh, over a 30-year stranding program um, since starting in the early 80s. And as you can see here, aside from the unknowns in the black, um, <laughs> sorry, uh, our top threat has been um, previously fibropapillomatosis and the tumor disease. But that did start decreasing in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, which was a good thing. Uh, I, although we still have some areas that are considered hot spots. What our, our biggest and uh, issue up and coming in the past five years has been is the hook and fishing gear induced trauma. And in the past five years, it has increased dramatically. So also a breakdown of live and dead turtles. Um, we had this graph done previously from 82 to 2014. And during those years, you could kind of see their turtles were about half and half, half live, half dead, give or take. But since 2015 to 2019, even though we're seeing the same number, approximately the same number of strandings around, you know, 300, uh, the increase has been about 70% dead and um, maybe a quarter, 25% alive. And so I wanted to kind of point that out, although we don't have any data analysis done yet, there could be a possible connection between um, the increase in the, the fishing line cases and the increase in the dead turtles that we're getting. So switching over to our hawksbill strandings, um, they have been, as you can see in the title here, very few compared to our green turtle strandings, which were almost near 7,000 at the end of 2014. Um, here we have a total of 140, and that's over 30 years, only 140 strandings of hawksbills. So some of our research is going towards 
that as well. Why have, under the same Endangered Species Act, why have the green turtles been increasing in numbers where the hawksbills haven't? Some things we're looking into are diet, um, their nesting habitat, um, global warming, and so forth. But with that, the threats associated with the strandings um, and hawksbill, that's only 62, uh, almost half of them are um, fishing gear related. So uh, again, that shows us how important it is um, to evaluate our top threat of fishing gear interactions and how detrimental it could be to this uh, very rare and um, endangered hawksbill species, um, in addition to the green turtles as well. So I just wanted to put out there, uh, there is a website, hawaiihawksbills.org, um, to be able to report any hawksbill sightings that you may see. Uh, they are, we're trying to, um, Cheryl King kind of oversees it and doing photo identification. This was a hawksbill that was seen, originally seen in 2008 as a stranding and seen again in 2013. So doing photo recognition of the scutes or the scales on the side of the face to try and identify the individual hawksbills that we have here in Hawaii. Um, although not a pleasant picture, I did want to put a visual of what we're experiencing and what we're seeing as far as fishing line entanglements. Um, it, it isn't, it isn't pretty. Uh, it's, it's, something that we want to try to work towards of how we can collaborate to reduce this amount of fishing line. One uh, particular program that we're working with the Pacific Island Regional Office is FAST or Fishing Around Sea Turtles, trying to promote that it's okay to help. Um, that, you know, if you hook a turtle or if you see a turtle, you call the hotline. Um, if you're a fisherman and you you know, hook a turtle, be sure to reel it in. The biggest issue that we're seeing is that it's the fishing line, um, as you saw in the previous oh, pictures, um, that uh, is really what causes um, the harm to the turtles. They get entangled in it, they are submerged or they drown. Um, in addition to ingesting the line, that can cause internal digestive problems. So the hook can be considered almost like a piercing, but it's really the line that we're trying to minimize and mitigate. So again, it's okay to help. Um, even if you're not a fisherman and you see the turtle, you know, I, I want to be clear here though that it's not, you know, everybody trying to help in the water. This is if it's on shore or if you actually hooked a turtle. Um, if, if the turtle is on shore and or if you were able to reel it in, please call the hotline and have our stranding associates be able to respond and to assist. Um, sometimes the fishing line is so deep that it may cause more harm by trying to remove it than just leaving it. So again, I encourage you to call the hotline, the Sea Turtle Stranding Hotline, which I'll be showing here shortly. Okay. So giving an idea of what we do um, for some of the different cases that we have, as you saw previous, we have had dead turtles. Um, and so, with our collaborators on the neighbor islands, they are able to collect them and then they ship them to Oahu where we conduct necropsies. And that's where we get the majority of our data from. Uh, in addition, we uh, assist with the live turtles and our collaborators in the past have been Aloha Air Cargo and Hawaiian Air Cargo. They've been very helpful in getting our live animals um, shipped for care. So once they are shipped to us, let's, for the live animals, this is for the rehabilitation process. Um, then we do have a veterinary lab where uh, oftentimes the more common cases that we have are the flipper line entanglements um, needing flipper amputation. So, you know, x-rays tend to show uh, a broken, um, a broken flipper uh, that they need to remove the whole uh, a flipper. 
this was a case that was shipped to us from Kahana, uh, flipper amputation by PSD veterinarian Dr. Michelle Barbieri, who led the surgery. And then we typically have them in our rehabilitative care for approximately two weeks before shipping them back and having them re-released on Maui. Hey, Shondell, um, this is Darla. Do you mind if I ask, is, is there ever a replacement of broken bones during a turtle surgery? So here in Hawaii, we typically do not replace the bones or try to use prosthetics. Mm -hmm. I know in other places in the country in the world, such as Florida, they have other facilities uh, that are nonprofits and receive more funding for long-term rehabilitative care to try and facilitate um, like either replacing or prosthetics that to be able to care for long that would be one maybe one to two years where we're really a short-term care facility okay thank you mm -hmm. this you know um, going back to following the the surgery. We do keep them in our tanks. Typically, it is a successful surgery for about two weeks. Um, but aside from the entanglements, we do have other cases, and the more common ones are buoyant, buoyancy issues. And this was a buoyant turtle that was shipped to us um, from Wahikuli Beach Park in Maui, uh, October of last year. Um, as you, you know, so it was seen in the water, actually unable to dive. And at that time, they're, they're unable to get down to get food resources. They become emaciated. Um, they, they really tend to struggle and use a lot of energy. So we will take x-rays to try to determine if possibly there is gas in the intestines or gas in the body cavity. And, um, and then that helps us determine you know what source or uh, direction of treatment we should go um, this turtle seemed to have gas in the intestines it was really an unusual case that we we tried many different treatments on unfortunately we were unsuccessful with this case so of course here we are uh, during times of COVID-19 um, where we uh, obviously view safety first for our personnel, for the people that are reporting strandings, for working together um, where we're having to follow state orders. Uh, and so here on Oahu and for our facility, uh, we are very limited in any, any rehabilitative care during these times. And what has been great is um, Maui Ocean Center Marine Institute stepping up and being able to help us out with our rehabilitative care. So um, since March, we have had two flipper amputation surgeries where the turtle was found with severe damage to the flipper and it was shipped to us on Oahu and our veterinarian, Dr. Greg Levine, was able to perform the flipper amputation surgery here, and then the turtle was shipped back to Maui Ocean Center for rehabilitative care. And they were able to monitor and then release the turtles. So that was for two flipper amputation surgeries. We also had two minor surgery amputations, meaning the flipper was barely attached. So it was not much, it was not an invasive procedure. Um, in addition, we do have euthanasias, and there were two. One was that buoyancy case, uh, actually a, a, another buoyancy case, and then we had a severely tumored case, and they, um, it, that turtle had a, a large, we call it glottal, but a, a large tumor blocking its oral uh, passageway. So I also, again, want to give a big thanks to uh, Maui Ocean Center Marine Institute um, for their help. This is the release of our last surgery patient. It was shipped over to us in August. Um, so they tend to, they have been tending to it, feeding it, um, you know, monitoring, making sure the wound, the surgery site all looks good. And then they were able to release it. This turtle was from Lahaina. So it was released back on, I believe it's Canoe Beach in Lahaina. 
So I also wanted to mention that in addition to strandings, we're also trying to monitor any sightings. So as um, Maui is responding to, you know, many of these cases, even on the beach, they're able to put these numbers on their shells. This one has MA11, and um, it was originally, you know, seen and had fishing line and small hooks. They were able to remove it and mark it. So we always like to see photos of them back in their natural habitat and doing well. And um, um, so this was seen off of McKenna Landing by um, some divers that reported to Bo Blinsky. Um, so again, I wanna put it out there to, uh, that to report a sea turtle sighting, please email respect wildlife at noaa.gov. And I'm gonna put the, all of these um, contact, the contact number at, for strandings, the email addresses at the end of the presentation as well. So getting into the deaths, um, unfortunately, that we're seeing, uh, give you insight of what happens when they are shipped to us at the NOAA IRC lab on Oahu. We do have necropsy sessions, and as you can see, um, we end up taking them out to thaw, because they're typically frozen. And then we um, collaborate as a team to open them up to gain samples, um, and mainly we are trying to determine the threat, the, the cause, not the cause, but the threats that were exhibited during, uh, or because of the stranding. So any threats that they have, may have had, whether it be a boat strike, shark attack, fishing line, and any internal um, you know, concerns that we may be able to identify. In addition to collecting samples and data, uh, that goes towards our research. That includes aging studies, DNA analysis, and diet studies. So I wanted to mention too, I know there's some areas in Maui that people often see uh, with the tumors and different degrees of affliction, the mild affliction or moderate to severe affliction that's blocking their eyes and their mouth. Um, so there you know, is a very easy to read paper out there that kind of des describes what the disease is and what's going on. Uh, it is we, a form of the herpes virus and reptiles. Um, and we do know that there is an environmental component, but the, the, an exact cause has not been identified. So as I mentioned previously, um, we do have to make decisions on whether we, you know, euthanasia is the humane option for some of our strandings. So the criteria we use um, are prognosis of survival, uh, the history of the animal, like had it stranded more than once, um, has it deteriorated from the previously time, previous time we saw it, uh, is it a turtle tumor? And the location and size of tumors. Again, is it on the eyes, blocking the eyes? Are they very large? Are they? Is it blocking in the mouth? Uh, you know, keep, keeping them from being able to eat, get food. Uh, also, their body condition. Uh, if you see big, healthy, robust turtles that we, <laughs> I will say, I think Maui has the biggest. You guys, you know, can say that <laughs> the, the the largest, healthiest, robust turtles that we get, so um, they're, they're doing pretty well, but of course there are some that we see that aren't in such great body condition, uh, especially if they are, haven't been able to eat or they have some of those other threats that are affecting. And then the activity level of the turtle, is it very slow, not really moving? And so there are several factors that we take into consideration, and, and especially when it comes to trauma, that's, that's a big one as, as far as um, the suffering of the animal and not wanting the animal to suffer. So what comes out of the stranding data? Well, the stranding network and long-term data sets provide us with information on the biology, life history, ecology, and disease of the marine turtles here in the Hawaiian Islands. Um, and for us, this data stream has contributed to a minimum of 65 publications, allowing us to gain a better understanding of threats 
and mortality over time, as well as continued study into the basic biology of marine turtles. So with that, I'd like to give a big mahalo to all of our collaborating agencies. Um, you know, definitely uh, Maui Ocean Center Marine Institute, MOCMI, Tommy Cutt, uh, Tapani, Alyssa, Thank you so much for all of your help and stepping up, especially during this time of COVID and with all, all of the cases that have been coming up on Maui. Um, we have seen, and from what they have said, that there has been an increase in the number of cases since COVID because more people are fishing. And so it, there's more interactions, of course, more turtles, more interactions. So also University of Hawaii Maui, uh, or Marine Option, program, uh, Donna Brown, Sonoma Boynton, and then our MTBAP team here on Oahu, and then all of our collaborating agencies that help with our strandings uh, in the Maui Nui Complex, um, Palama Lanai, the Nature Conservancy, and the Humpback Whale Sanctuary, and you know they used to help out tremendously, and they, I know that they still do, DLNR, Don't Care, Hawaii Wildlife Fund, um, yeah, and, and Joint Institute Marine Biology. So as I said before, here are the numbers uh, to call and numbers and emails to keep in mind when uh, you want you need to report a sea turtle stranding. Please call 1-888-256-9840, and that is actually for any marine stranding on in the, throughout the islands. It will direct you to. Uh, It'll direct you to what species and what island you're trying to report. Uh, the website for Hawksbill sightings is hihawksbills.com. That's H-I-H-A-W-K-S-B-I-L-L-S.com. And then if you wanna report a sea turtle sighting that we're, we're seeing with, uh, also with numbers, any, uh, we have our nesters that um, Cameron might talk about as well as, any numbers you want to, any turtles that you see numbers or tags, please report to respectwildlife at noaa.gov. Okay, thank you. Well, that was just amazing, Shondell. And we do have a couple of questions that have come in uh, from Facebook. Sharon asks, when a flipper amputee is released, can they dive and swim adequately to survive? They can. We have seen them out there, um, and you know we've given them a couple of have a couple of nicknames: tripod. Uh, yes, so they can swim and feed just normally. The only thing that might hinder is if they are a male and repro reproduction and trying to reproduce later in life as an adult. Okay. Well, um, also. You know, you were talking about how fishermen can help with the fishing line and you uh, mentioned that non-fishermen can, can also help. I, I can imagine that there might be a little bit of, of danger in there. So um, always a good idea to call first and will they give instructions over the phone then to, to you know, to be safe in trying to remove line if it's around a mouth area? Typically, yes. Actually, for most of the time, um, if it's, you know, ingested or deeply embedded, they will wait. They won't have, they won't ask the public to do anything, but other than wait for them to get there to respond. So we can handle it um, and, and not do any more damage. Okay, great. And Christine Hartman has a question that actually I was thinking of too. Um, when you were talking about uh, hawksbill strandings are, are less than the green sea turtle. And our, our, my question actually is, uh, are the numbers of hawksbill quite less than green sea turtles? Was that factored into the stranding numbers? Yes, so the number, we, we base the population off the nesting numbers and the number of hawksbill female nesters is much lower too, I think less than 100. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Well, those are the questions that we have for you for right now. Uh, and so now we're going to turn it over to Dr. Cameron Allen, and we are going to continue this great discussion on sea turtles. So Dr. Cameron, are you ready to, uh, to enlighten us?
Well, I see her presentation coming up. I'm not hearing you if you're if you're talking yet. All right. I'm sorry. I just had to figure out how to unmute myself after I shared my screen. Hang on. Let me try that again. <laughs> um, Isn't technology wonderful? All right. Hopefully you can see my screen. Yes. Great. Okay, I'm gonna jump in. So initially we proposed that my talk would be about what we're finding out about the sex ratios of sea turtles at our foraging grounds and the potential effects of climate change. And I know that you guys had really, really good questions about other aspects of the sea turtles within uh, the Hawaiian archipelago. So I changed the title to incorporate that to the potential effect of climate change on turtle populations. Because we're gonna talk a little bit more about climate effects just on the sex ratios and expand it a little bit to more about the impacts on their environment as well. Um, mm -hmm. I put this photo here to kind of give you a little bit of a background on myself. So I'm actually a reproductive biologist masquerading as a sea turtle scscientist. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm really excited to be here living in Hawaii and amongst all of you and the amazing animals here. So I might not have all the answers, but I definitely try to figure them out. And I'm really excited to be working with everybody here. So thanks for coming. Um, what I'm gonna be presenting is a lot of data collected by a lot of different groups. So I just wanted to give a smattering of them here and say thank you already and get into it. So Shandell already mentioned some of the threats that we have to sea turtles within the Hawaiian archipelago. One of the main ones is obviously um, fishing uh, by catch. So either in commercial or recreational fisheries. We also have disease, which is fiber papilloma, habitat degradation, pollution, harvest of turtles, and climate change. So I'm really gonna focus on the climate change aspect with relation to the threats to our sea turtles here. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was the increase in temperatures. Um, within the schematic that I'm showing here, the, you can see there's a lot of red on the screen. So from 1990 to 2019, there's been an increase in the temperatures globally, and we're expecting this to continue on into the future. And what does that have an effect on uh, sea turtles? So there's an image here showing a hand with a little data logger in it. It's about the size of a quarter. And we put those into sea turtle nests for them to record the data and the temperatures within the nests as they're incubating. So I'm gonna talk about that data that we've been collecting. So we have a nest that's incubating and the eggs within the nest are about the size of a ping pong ball and they're also squishy. So when the females are laying their eggs, they actually don't break open as they plop on top of each other like a chicken egg. They're soft and squishy. So as they fall down, they don't, they don't hurt each other. But what's really interesting is as the nests are incubating, it's actually the temperature which determines the sex of the turtles. So it's whether they're male or female is determined by the temperature which the eggs incubate and it's that second trimester where that sex is actually determined. So today it was probably in the mid 80s temperature for everybody within the archipelago I'd say and 84 degrees is actually the temperature which produces 50 percent female and 50 percent male. So if today it was about 84 degrees, you know we get warmer days and cooler days. So today you'd probably get about 50-50, but if it was a warmer day, you'd probably get more females. So remember those data loggers I mentioned before, we put them in some sea turtle nests up at the sea turtle's main nesting beach, East Island, and some nests are laid between May and July. And the nests that were laid in May earlier in the season were much cooler and they took longer to incubate. And the nests that were laid in June, which is during the peak nesting season, took less time. And then those in July took even less time because as the eggs are incubating in warmer temperatures, they, um, 
they get bigger faster, the babies get bigger faster, and they get closer to hatching more quickly. So the estimated pivotal temperature for producing 50% males and 50% females within Hawaii is about 29 degrees. And there's a purple line on the graph showing that. And you can see that a lot of the temperatures within the nest are above that line towards the end of the next incubation period. And what's interesting is once you get past that sort of threshold of 29 degrees or about 30 or 84 degrees Celsius, something else happens, which is embryonic death. So if you get about 34 degrees, the nests not only don't hatch, the, the, the babies within the eggs will actually die. So there's two folds here that we're having an issue with for sea turtles is the warmer the temperatures, the more females are produced, the even warmer the temperatures, we might actually have a loss of turtles. So we actually have data loggers, which we put in the sand, not in a nest as controls, just throughout the whole entire nesting beach to figure out what the temperatures are throughout the season. And we've done that historically for many, many years. So we have an idea of what it looks like throughout the season and over years in those same exact locations. And we can compare those to the temperatures within actual nests over the years. And what we've been seeing is that those controls are are a lot cooler than the nest, and that's because of the energy and the heat that the, the hatchlings and the eggs are, are producing. So what we should actually be seeing is much higher temperatures compared to the controls within the nest, which makes sense. So we're really interested to see over the years as we keep comparing these controls to the data loggers we have in the nest, if we're seeing those nest temperatures and the sand temperatures tend to increase as we see more effects of climate change. Hey, Cameron, real quick, can you tell us what 34 degrees Celsius is in Fahrenheit? 80, 84 degrees Fahrenheit is 29 degrees Celsius. Okay. Yeah. Is that what you asked? Well, I was looking at that upper region where we get into the risk area. Um, and for those of us oh. that didn't make it past the entry level college science and only deal in Fahrenheit. <laughs> for the higher level. Uh, off the top of my head, I'm going to go with like 96, but that's probably too high. Shandell, can you Google it for me and put it in the chat? What's 34? degrees celsius to fahrenheit <laughs> thanks i'm sorry i should know that off the top of my head it's too warm for them yeah for sure it's too hot for me Oof. uh so what have we been finding when we've been looking at the sex ratios of sea turtles at foraging grounds we've looked at a couple within the pacific a lot of this is still preliminary data we don't have all of the samples we want to collect but the foraging grounds give us a really good idea of what's happening within the population because it's juveniles, subadults, and adult turtles in one location. So you have a smattering of ages of different turtles that have come from nesting beaches over many years. It's not just like one year's worth of turtles that you're looking at. So we have multiple locations and in San Diego we're finding that the sex ratio is 3.5 females to one male. Long Beach, it's seven females to one male. Within Hawaii, it's 3.4 females to one male. Saipan, it's 2.0 females. Guam is 2.8. And in Australia, it's 3.3 females to one male. So as you can see, all of these are female bias that we've looked at so far. This is still for green turtles. And what's really interesting is we took a deep, oh, Yes, Hawaii. Back in the 80s, there was actually a sex ratio study conducted in Hawaii, and it found that it was about a one-to-one -one sex ratio. So since then, we've actually seen that uptick here in our populations. Mind you, we still haven't collected all the samples that we want to collect from all the foraging loaf grounds that we want to collect from, so this could change, but so far with preliminary data, we're seeing a, a pretty good tick up in the number of females we're, we're getting here. So what does that kind of mean? This new uptick is probably these contemporary hatchling cohorts 
coming into these foraging grounds. So turtles that have hatched in the last 10 years are finally starting to settle at our foraging grounds here within Hawaii. And we're starting to be able to sample them and see that potentially there may be an effect of climate change on our nesting grounds where the temperatures have been increasing and producing more female hatchlings. In Australia, we took a bigger dive into that population because it's been studied so long and so well. Now the figure I'm about to show you didn't come across very well, but I'm just going to describe it to you really quickly. This is Australia and in the northern part on the east coast, there's a nesting population there in the northern Great Barrier Reef and there's a pie graph that shows B1. What I want you to focus on here is that the B1 has a lot of white. In the bottom part in the southern Great Barrier Reef, there's a pie chart that has a lot of yellow and you can see that based on the white and the yellow, there's not a lot of overlap between these two populations in terms of their genetics. So these two, two populations are genetically different so that if you collect a turtle at a foraging ground and get a sample and run it for genetics, you are easily able to determine if it came from the Northern Great Barrier Reef or the Southern Great Barrier Reef. Yeah. So we went to a foraging ground in the Northern Great Barrier Reef and captured over 300 turtles in about two weeks. And we tried to figure out the sex of the younger turtles. And we have some juvenile and subadults, which are the immature turtles, and then some adult turtles, which are the mature turtles. And within that population, there were, of course, females and males. And the northern sea turtles are shown in this red portion. And the southern Great Barrier Reef turtles are shown in blue. So you have northern and southern Great Barrier Reef turtles in all three of these stage classes. But when you only look at the subadult and the juveniles, if you have a look at the males, you'll see that there's no red, indicating that there's no males from the northern Great Barrier Reef population in the younger size classes. And this indicated that there's almost no immature Northern Great Barrier Reef males coming from that Northern Great Barrier Reef population. It was about 99% female. So if we looked at this, the temperature at the time points and when those different size classes were born, so the adults were born, you know, probably 25 to 50 years ago. During that point in time, there was plenty of years where the temperatures were cool enough to produce male turtles. So in this graph, there's the pivotal temperature is at zero, and there's a lot of bars above and below that, which indicate that there should be plenty of years when male and female turtles were produced. And if you look at the subadult area, there's almost no blue lines that show that there were any years in which the temperatures were cool enough for males to be produced. And if you look at the juveniles, there's about one or two years where the males could have been produced from those nesting grounds. So this really shined a light on that over the years we've seen an increase in the temperature at these nesting beaches and then it's likely that as the temperatures continue to increase that climate change could start to feminize our turtle populations. So if we go back to that to the slide where I showed the different sex ratios at the foraging grounds in the Pacific, we can actually see that the sex ratio of that Australia population is not actually 3.3 females to one male. In the subadults, it was 554 females to one male. And in the juveniles, it was 116 females to one male, which is pretty crazy if you think of that. Males can go a long way, but I don't know if they can mate with 500 females <laughs> in one season. So we're pretty curious to see what happens with that population in the future. And because that's one of the largest green sea turtle populations in the world with hundreds of thousands of females, we're curious what might be happening in our smaller populations, like within the Mariana Archipelago and within Hawaii, where it's thousands of females, not hundreds of thousands. So stay tuned, We're, we'll figure it out. 
Now talking about the Honuea or the hawksbill sea turtles, what's interesting about them is that they do nest within the main Hawaiian islands, but they also have this added sort of sand color impact on the potential of their nest to be incubate even warmer. So they do nest some places on black sand beaches, which could cause the nest to be incubating at a higher temperature. But what's really cool about hawksbills is they like to nest in the vegetation. So they get back there and they thrash around and they dig their nest and they have a lot of shade over their nest, which keep them cooler. So that's one really cool thing about the hawksbills and their nesting and the potential for their nest to not be as hot because they nest towards the vegetation. Hey Cameron, do you mind if I ask, are there severe weather events that also affect turtle populations? There are. Um, so hurricanes do come by sea turtle nesting beaches a lot. Um, so you'll see a lot of impacts of that in Florida. And then recently we had some impacts within Hawaii as well, because a lot of the nesting beaches within the Pacific Islands region are low-lying beaches or atolls, they're really subject to those catastrophic environmental impacts. Yeah. I'm gonna talk about some of them now. Okay, so resilience to climate change. And one of the things that we wanna talk about is catastrophic events and habitat loss. This photo here is actually delineating the outline of East Island, which is one of the green sea turtles main nesting beach within Hawaii. And it was washed away during the 2018 Hurricane Walaka. So the Honu within Hawaii nest in the northwest of the main Hawaiian Islands in the Papahanaumokuake Marine National Monument at uh, Lalo or French Frigate Shoals. It's one of the atolls that's 500 miles from Oahu. So the turtles within the main Hawaiian Islands will swim about 500 miles round trip to go nest to that location. And 96% of the Honu do nest up there. So it's very limited number of nesting for green sea turtles within the main Hawaiian Islands. The two locations within Lalo that they nest is Turn Island and East Island. And if you can imagine an embryo in an egg, like a chick egg, that's what the Lalo or French frigate shoals looks like. It's very turquoise and beautiful with teeny tiny little islands um, that you can see from one end to the other and usually walk around within 20 minutes. So Turn Island was actually turned into an aircraft carrier in the World War II and that's pretty much what it looks like. It has like a big runway on the middle of it and it's four-sided with seawalls on both sides and you can see that there's a lot of breakdown of the seawalls and some dilapidated buildings that are still remaining there. And East Island is a pristine coral island. Uh, there's not much on it besides wildlife and some shrubs and the water is just stunning turquoise. And if you've ever seen any of the footage of the sharks eating the albatross chicks, that is where this island, that's where that's filmed is at this island, East Island. So you should definitely check out that footage on YouTube. So as I mentioned in late 2018, uh, Hurricane Wallaka went right past French Frigate Shoals and actually obliterated East Island. The photo I'm showing above is East Island with the tent where our field researchers would normally stay for about four to six months each year to count the number of turtles that are nesting there. And the photo below is in October of 2018 after the hurricane went past and you can see that most of the island is gone. And that's where the tent would have been if our field researchers were still there. So thank goodness we, we got them out. East Island in May of 2019, it is built back up over the winter and you can actually see some turtles, the little black spots on the island just hanging out there. Um, so it's definitely big enough for them to haul out on and bask on during the day and they can still do some nesting. In the middle of it, you'll kind of see it, it pinches in, it looks a little bit like an hourglass 
Uh, so it's not back to its former shape, but it is building back up for sure. What our field researchers saw when they went up there after Hurricane Malacca in 2019 was that it was larger. Uh, however, it did erode away throughout the summer and a lot of the nests that were laid were washed out of the berm. So you, the image that I'm showing here shows that the berm height is not very high and there was a lot of high tides that would wash over into the middle of the island towards that saddle and it would kind of flood in the middle. So we feel that a lot of the nests that were laid that season were potentially inundated with water uh, or they were potentially washed out of the berm. And in August of 2020, so recently, East Island looks much the same as it did in 2019. This photo has a lot of clouds covering the island, but you can still see a smattering of turtles uh, basking on the island, which is, is pretty cool to see. Uh, so our team is pretty eager to get up there next season to see how many of the nests look like they may have survived this past nesting season. So the next part about sea turtles resiliency to climate change is the, we previously talked about habitat loss and now I wanted to talk about habitat quality. We're back on Turn Island, which is that aircraft carrier with the seawall that's pretty rusty and there's a ton of turtles laying up on the beach with some frigate birds checking them out. It's a pretty spectacular place. Uh, so before Wallaka came past, you can see Turn Island still has the runway in the middle, but it's not active anymore. So there are a lot of um, birds that nest on the runway and there is some vegetation. There's lots of big vegetation close to the, to the berm line. It's, and it's kind of higher vegetation. It's not above your head. But the turtles would hit that vegetation and wouldn't go any further and they would nest like pretty high up on the berm but wouldn't go into the middle of the island. And you can see some frigate birds chilling out on the vegetation and a lot of uh, boobies and other birds. And to give you an idea of the size of the vegetation, there's some humans walking next to it and it's probably waist height high, maybe to shoulder height. So after the hurricane hit, you can see that there's a lot of sand that came up onto the shore almost all the, way, all the way into the middle of the island on top of the runway. And almost all of the vegetation that was on that southern border of the island has been washed away. If you can imagine just like a flat landscape now with just tiny patches of small vegetation, no big shrubs, um, and just some seabirds hanging around. You can see a uh, building off in the distance that's the old fish and wildlife barracks. And there's some sea turtle uh, crawl marks on the island as well. So the turtles are coming up over the berm past where that vegetation would have been and continuing on to the middle of the island where the runway would have been. The Yellow dots I'm showing here are the nests that were closer towards the shoreline because the turtles couldn't go in towards the island because of the vegetation. The pink dots that I'm showing are the 2019 nests where the turtles could continue up the berm and into the nests, um, sorry, into the island, into the middle of the island. And our researchers actually did some pretty cool stuff to figure out the quality of the sand up in towards the middle of the island and they dug holes to figure out the depth of the sand the furthest down that they could go as they were digging themselves because what they were finding is that the females would come up and dig a nest but they weren't really liking it because they couldn't dig deep enough and they would move on and continue digging more nests until they found a spot that they liked so the researchers found that towards the middle of the island where the runway was the sand depth was zero to 20 centimeters deep Further towards the ocean, towards the south, it was 20 to 40 centimeters deep. And then once you get back towards the berm where the vegetation used to be, it's 40 to 66 centimeters deep. So where the turtles were trying to continue moving into, the sand depth was not deep enough to allow them to lay a nest properly. 
And the black dots that I have popped up now are actually where they found hatch craters that season. In other words, where successful nests were laid, where hatchlings actually emerged from those nests. And all of those nests are closer to the berm where that vegetation line used to be. It's very limited nesting that actually was successful towards the middle of the island. So the quality of the habitat on Turn Island is a concern, not only because of them getting access further into the island where the nest, where the sand temperature isn't deep enough, but they have to also compete with trying to get out of the island on the other side where the seawall is a barrier for them and it's also pretty rickety. There's a lot of um, World War II discards and a lot of copper wire on the sand, which they can get caught in as well. So the habitat quality on Turn Island, which is the main nesting beach left for them to nest on, is, is not that great. For the Honuea or the Hawksbill, their habitat quality is pretty good, but it's challenging. They like to nest up in the vegetation, as I mentioned, which means they travel pretty far over lava rock and boulders, sometimes crossing roads. Um, and their locations are pretty remote, so it's hard to get to them to find out where they are actually nesting. And Alexander Gauss in our program is actually gonna start trying to fly a UAV over those locations to try to see if there's other nesting beaches where hawksbills are nesting within the main Hawaiian Islands. So that's pretty cool. So in summary, uh, I didn't say this, but I wanna say it. The Honu population within Hawaii is actually increasing 3.2% annually, and that's the number of nesting females. That's our denominator um, for Shannon, Sharon, whoever asked that question. And the Honuea population hasn't increased like the Honu. As Shandell mentioned, um, the population is about one hawksbill to every nine green sea turtles, so you won't see them very often. If you do get to see them, you're pretty lucky. And we also have a Hawksbill Wanted flyer poster. We're really curious where people are seeing those Hawksbills. Uh, so yeah, let us know at respectwildlife at noaa.gov if you see Hawksbills out and around. Of course, maintain a safe distance. Sea turtles like social distancing too. So just snap a picture from a little further away and let us know. Um, in summary, there are a lot of climate impacts for turtles. Temperature could cause feminization or embryonic death. Habitat loss is due to hurricanes and likely soon it'll be due to sea level rise and water inundation suffocating the nests. And habitat quality has decreased for green sea turtles and it can be a bit challenging for the, for the hawksbills. Uh, and with that, I'd like to acknowledge everybody that's done all the research over the past couple of years. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for having us today. It's really fun to talk turtles with you all. That was really interesting. And, you know, I, I just wanted to follow up on one thing. If the turtle population is currently going up, is there any kind of prediction of when these feminization impacts will have an effect on the population numbers? What's crazy about turtles is they don't reach sexual maturity until about 25 years old. So the turtles that we're seeing that are really young are probably 10 to 15 years old. So we have another 10 to 15 years before we see them reach sexual maturity. And we may start to see that influx of nesting females on the nesting beach. So okay. I'm, I'm guessing we've got about 10 years before we start to see the major effects of that. Okay, uh, Elizabeth Hurd actually asked a related question. So okay. if the population is feminized, does that mean an increase in eggs and hatchlings? It does, and that's actually a really good thing for our populations within Hawaii because they're both threatened for green sea turtles and endangered for hawksbills. So more females, of course, means more babies, which is great. But what you have is you get an increase in the number, you probably get a plateau, and then once there becomes too many females, you start to head back down because there's not enough males to mate with those females and then continue producing enough hatchlings. Um, so right now we're still in that up climb and we're hoping that we hit the plateau and never go down. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, yeah I, I wanted to mention too, Sharon uh, Seamus via Facebook is our 
math winner of 34 degrees Celsius is 93.2 Fahrenheit. Yes. Oh. See, I was too high with 96. Yeah. <laughs> well, us Americans that didn't learn Celsius in the metric system. So. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, well, living thank in you. Australia didn't teach me well enough what uh, <laughs> what that temperature was, but I just knew it was hot. Too hot for me. <laughs> yeah. Hot, hot for humans. It's got to be hot for the turtles. Yeah. So um, very, very interesting. Hey, before we wrap up today's presentation, we wanted to bring you a couple of brief updates from Maui Nui Marine Resource Council. Meredith, are you ready with the oyster clip? Yes, I am. Sorry, I was muted. Here we go. <laughs> I'm not sure that it's plain. You might have. You're not able to see it? I, I don't think it's plain. We saw it, but I don't think, I think you need to hit the play button once you project it. Let me try this again. Roll that beautiful oyster footage. There you go. You know? Amy Hodges here, Programs and Operations Manager with Maui Nui Marine Resource Council. We're here at Ma'alaya Harbor, uh, the site of the Oyster Bioremediation Project. Just a little update for you guys on the Oyster Project. Right now we have about 3,000 oysters here in the harbor. We've got 16 cages full of them here. Uh, we're still using all of the Pacific triploid oysters, uh, but just this week we harvested about 100 of the smaller native Hawaiian oysters from the harbor here that were actually growing on the outside of our cages. They had come and recruited onto our cages. So we harvested a few of those, sent them over to the aquaculture facility in Hilo. Uh, so they went over there to have a spa day. They're going to be there for a few months while they spawn and propagate and make babies. And then our friends over in Hilo are going to ship a bunch of them back to us here about 3,000 by the end of the year, and they'll get put back into the harbor here um, to help double our numbers and filter the water. So that's what's going on with that. Um, this Friday, we actually have 700 more of these specific triploid species oysters coming to join us. So again, those are coming from Hilo. And uh, we're also continuing to monitor the ocean uh, water quality here. So we're doing nutrient grab samples. We're using our Manta probe. We're doing spot sampling with that, and today we'll be uh, installing via scuba a sond from Pac Ios um, here right at the oyster site. And what's interesting about that is it will continuously monitor the water quality every five minutes for 28 days in a row. Um, so we'll get continuous water quality monitoring. And on that sond is one sensor that monitors chlorophyll A, which will be a new parameter for us to monitor, um, which is linked to the oyster project, since these guys are involved with chlorophyll A. So that'll be some new data for us to have. Um, other than that, the oysters are doing well. It's sponsored by the Mayor's Office, uh, County of Maui Mayor's Office of Economic Development. They've been longtime supporters of the Oyster Project and will be again next year. So at the end of this year, we'll have about 6,000 oysters in the harbor and we hope to double that uh, in 2021. That's the update. Thank you. Hey, mahalo, Amy. Your enthusiasm is infectious. That was amazing. And you know, we're at the hottest time of the year for many parts of the country. So let's hear from MNMRC about protecting the marine environment through uh, fire mitigation. Hi, I'm Mike Fogarty. I'm acting director at Maui Nui Marine Resource Council. And I want to share a progress report with you on our Poakea project. That's a Poakea watershed. Uh, we're just one permit away from allowing our contractor and our partner, Goodfellow Brothers, to come on to the project site and start their work on building fire breaks throughout the watershed. The fire breaks are important because that will help suppress wildfire. It will help keep the vegetation in place 
and mitigate some of that heavy sediment that's flowing into Ma'alea Bay. I do want to mention that that uh, work is funded by a grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, which is a federal grant. And that grant is supported and matched by the county of Maui and by your donations as well. So that brings some desperately needed work to our county at this, at this time during COVID. So we thank all of you for your, your support for the Poakea Watershed Project. Well, thank you everyone for joining and participating to discuss, discuss turtle strandings and sex ratios of sea turtles and our update from MNMRC. I wanted to let you know that coming up Wednesday, October 7th, is another free Zoom webinar offered by Maui Nui Marine Resource Council. To receive free information about this and future events, please visit MauiReefs.org and sign up for the Reef and Brief e-newsletter or follow m, m RC on Facebook. Special thanks to our presenters today, Shondell Brunson and Dr. Cameron Allen. Mahalo also to the County of Maui Office of Economic Development for supporting the Know Your Ocean Virtual Monthly Speaker Series. You'll be able to view this webinar on m, &M RC's Facebook page and YouTube channel on Akaku Community Media and listen on the radio on Kony 104.7, KROC 97.3, KRYL Country 106.5, and Retro 102.1 on Maui, Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Maui Nui Marine Resource Council works for healthy coral reefs, clean ocean water, and abundant native fish for the islands of Maui County. And you can learn more at MauiReefs.org. Thank you again for joining us, everybody. And mahalo. Mahalo, guys. Thank you. Bye. Aloha. Thank you. Bye.